Yeah, man. So I appreciate okay. you coming through and I appreciate you, you know, taking the time out of your day. And we can hopefully, or well, definitely people will learn from this discussion and yeah. people can take and glean what they can to hopefully improve on themselves and improve on their mental space. So let's, let's start at the beginning. You, as similar as I, were in school and we didn't really achieve. Yeah. So I don't see it as taking time out of my day because if I look at my day, what is my day all about? My day is all about giving to people. So there is a, when we look at taking out of stuff, it means that we're lacking. I'm getting this opportunity. I'm not giving anything to you. Well, I appreciate you saying to, that. To, uh, you know, I'm not giving. I'm getting. I'm receiving. I'm receiving the opportunity to speak to you. I'm receiving the opportunity for people watching this on your YouTube channel. And I'm also receiving this as an opportunity for me to grow as a speaker. Because you might say something that profoundly impacts the journey that I'm on right now. So I'm not taking anything. Like, I'll do this the whole day with you if you if you if you want me to because you know my mission is to leave everyone I speak to feeling more hope more love and more inspiration for their lives because I never had anyone who had that you know I, I love that saying be the person you wish you had around when you were a child and I never had that person around when I was a child you know I I, I had people who put me down I we grew up in that in that time where we were integrating out of apartheid into the new South Africa. So you were still getting chosen last for the cricket team based on the color of your skin. You were still being discriminated. You know, you were still being called words. Most of those things are kind of died out now. So as much as I don't, you know, agree with, you know, so-and-so woke movement type mm -hmm. of thing, I think some of the things are so extreme. But I do see that, you know, um, it is moving in a, in a better direction. So I want to be that person because let's look at this. 20 years ago, okay, not even 20 years ago, 20 years ago is just around the corner. 40 years ago, a person like me would never been able to sit in a place like this with you and being able to have a conversation around mental health, mm -hmm. around business, around anything. Because firstly, no one would want to watch it. I wouldn't have gotten the opportunity. And the mindset of the country and very much the world wouldn't have been receptive to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you mentioned, obviously, growing up in the apartheid regime and then, you know, obviously seeing it through. You said that you didn't really have the support, obviously, from the community, obviously, from the government institution. But how was your home environment? Look, my mom's a nurse. So she's got compassion for everything. If I've learned one thing from my mom, it's compassion. My dad has his demons. My dad and I have never really seen eye to eye on anything. He's a university professor, believes that academia is the way, he believes that, you know, if you, if you throw in some really uh, high uh, words into a conversation that you can derail the other person. So do I love my dad? Yeah, I love my dad. Is he my favorite person in the world? No, not really. But if I've got a love, if I've got a hate, I don't, really, I don't really hate anyone or anything. But if I've got to discredit and got to hold against him all the bad things, I've also got to thank him for the good things. Because my taste in music, we have this music room. My taste in music is, is off the charts. You know, my love for art. You know, when I was a kid, I was fighting because my friends got a Pentium 2 and I had a 486. I don't know if, I don't know how old you are, whether that makes any sense no, not at all. to you or not. And I wanted a better computer so I could play games. Okay. But those other kids weren't growing up in a house where Tchaikovsky was being played. Mm -hmm. You only see that later in life when you think about what you've been exposed to and you think about that there's no such thing as good or bad. It's just a perception of it. So from a young age, always felt like an outcast. I never really had any friends. You know, I would be the, the kind of kid that all the kids would get together for Guy Fawkes and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to meet up at this park 
and then you show up at this park and they're at another park giggling and laughing that they tricked you into going to somewhere else. You know, then I look at my life and I'm like, oh shit, you know, I'm this outcast. Nobody wants me. Nobody wants to be around me. And why? You know, you're like seven years old. Why? And I think that kind of led to the when somebody gives you a little bit of attention and I'm not going to speak too much about it, but you know, I was sexually abused when I was a kid. And you you look at it and go, you know, li- life's gone, okay? The past, it's a memory. The only thing that keeps it alive is yourself, okay? You're the only person that can keep the past alive. The future is, the, the future is imagination. You know, we don't know what the future might hold. And we have to look at the future as not a place that we get to go to. Uh, it's a place we get to create. And it's the vision that's so important. Most people don't have a vision because they're so stuck in the past that they um, create a future which is a replica of the past while missing the, the current moment. All we have is the now. So right then, now. you know, obviously you did have things in your past and growing up that were, you know, difficult to experience, difficult to go through. But how do you then not forget the past in the sense that you just, you know, it didn't happen, but accept it and be like, okay, well, I can't change it. So this is the reality that I experienced mm. when I was younger. And this is how I'm going to use it to maybe empower me or be a better person. Like, how do you get past the the hurt and the torment to be able mm. to use that almost to be able to formulate who you become mm. as opposed to use it as almost like a victim card? But So let's look at this way. You and I are both going for a campaign. We're competitors in an industry, Okay. You come from money. You come from a, a, a home that is supportive, okay? We're going to compete. There's going to be a winner and a loser, okay? So what? What I've gone through has made me stronger, okay? You might have all the money. You might have all the brains. You might have, but there's certain things in life that you go through, that make you so tough as nails, that you're like, it doesn't matter whether you have all the money in the world, it doesn't matter whether you have the connections, it doesn't matter, because I know that when it comes to crunch time, we're going to have to step into a level of pain, and I know that pain. I've, I've made peace with that pain. I, I felt that pain. Have you? And that's what's going to separate you and me. Now, it could come across very, like, I see the term toxic masculinity, but it's, it's masculinity and femininity. It's, there's nothing toxic. It depends on how you view everything. But how you change it, how you take the past, I, I say to myself, so what? So what you were abusing you were a kid? So what they took your company away from you? So what you had to sleep in a car in the middle of winter and the security guard knocks at your window and then says, you know, you need to move your car? So what you have to sleep in an outside room at a friend's place on a blanket, not even a bed in the middle of winter? So what? Either you can stay there and keep on going on as a victim and keep on saying, what was me? That happened to me. Or you flip the script and go, yeah, that did happen to me. And you know what it did happen to me? It made me a champion. It made me stronger. Because I know that when it comes time to dig deep and dig real deep, I'm familiar with it. I know how it feels. So it cannot break me. You can push it to the limit. It cannot break me. Because I've been through worse and I managed to come out on the other side. Steve Harvey says you're going through hell. Keep going. At the end of pain is always pleasure and reward. But most people give up before they get to that, that reward. So you obviously you coach a lot of CEOs and businessmen and women. And you help them you know, get past certain things to be able to achieve more in business. So how do you then help someone that maybe hasn't had the difficult past? 
So now you need to help the person that came from money or came from privilege or came from certain perspective that there wasn't that much hardship. Obviously, every human to a certain degree has levels of hardship in their lives. But how do you help someone that maybe wasn't abused or help someone that didn't come from, you know, not knowing when the next meal was going to come from? How do you, you know, help that person? No trauma is bigger than another. Every trauma, your trauma is as equally as traumatic as mine. You might have been through something that I didn't be, I haven't been through. But see, you might not see it as trauma. You might see it as a way of growing up. You might see it as, as oh, I had everything I ever wanted. Good. Use it to example. Because then create the mindset that you are unstoppable, that you can use it, that you demand a seat at the table, that you are worth it, that you belong there. Because you have been bred, you are part of a pedigree, to go on and to win and by you not winning and by you not living up to that and you not saying hey i grew up i got i got my first car when i was 18 years old i got this i got to travel overseas use that to example because the same way that some kid suffering in the ghetto only knows pain you managed to go overseas with your family you managed to go to disneyland you managed to get on a plane you managed to open your mind you managed to see different places you managed to see different perspectives so play your game you know tap into what you've gone through and understand that yeah it doesn't have to be trauma that pushes you okay it doesn't always have to come from a place of negativ- negativity. It can come from a place of, I've been bred for this. You know, if you look at these horses that win at the Durban July and, and, and so on, they've been bred. They come from a lineage. And most people don't understand that. They think they're just, well, you know, dad was successful, mom was staying yeah, home. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that aspect of, you know, coming from a household that never had to worry, well, as a kid, I never saw my parents worrying financially or see mm. saw them stressing about money or saw them, you know, arguing over money aspects. And coming from that place of privilege, I now, as an adult, look at it and be like, I am fortunate enough to have been given these opportunities. I am fortunate enough to have been given you know a step above other people that maybe come from less fortunate backgrounds or whatever how can i squander that how can i not allow myself with what i've been given to push forward and to push for because that person that was maybe in a township or wherever or abused or whatever would rather not obviously have had that happen mm. if they've dealt with it maybe different story but how who am i to now take advantage or you know not utilize what i've been given yeah. And uh, you can use it as fuel. I know personally, I will see friends or family or those people that maybe don't have as much or don't have as strong of a mindset or, you know, have had financial backing or whatever. And I'll be like, I'm also doing this for them Mm. because they aren't fortunate enough to be able to have been in the positions that I've been put in and been given the opportunities that I've put in, been put in. Like, how can I not do it? Mm. And that fuels me just as much as maybe someone else that comes from a poverty area or comes from pain yeah. see you know the thing is it's it's comfort it's complacency so alex ferguson talks about that the worst disease that can happen to a person is complacency now somebody who comes from a, a background where they didn't have to worry too much and trust me it doesn't irrespective of the background you come from whether or not you grew up in a shack or whether or not whether you grew up in a in a mansion you still feel anxiety you still feel uh distant to other people you're still going to go through stuff you know the problem is that people who come from privilege become comfortable and that's what stops their growth because they've never had a fight it's a dog fight out there you know and being able being able to look at that and go this is this is my my. It's almost like I've never watched Game of Thrones. You need but, to, <laughs> but um, but you know the part where where uh, Peter Dinklage. I don't know what his character's name is. Where he says to Jon Snow, where he he said, um, uh, Jon Snow the bastard, and it's like own it. It's like own it. You know. 
own your trauma, own your 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 upbringing. Okay, you don't have to. I I know I know speakers out there who talk about being, oh, I didn't, I felt out of place at school. Yet they were the head boy of the school, the head girl of the school, or something like that. I'm like, don't make up a fucking story just to get sympathy from people. All right. But also, the person that maybe was head boy can still feel as much out of place as the person that's maybe the social outcast. Look, you don't know it, the person's upbringing. That person could be persecuted by their by their parents, by the dad, in a way that you would never know. And when they get done uh, head boy or head girl, they don't know what to do with it. Because now it's like, hey, like I'm I'm the person in charge now. You know, I'm a subordinate to to someone else. So for somebody who's who grew up in privilege, I think everyone grows up in privilege. Now it might be controversial. The fact that you get to wake up today, you're privileged. That doesn't matter whether you're white or black or Indian or whatever skin color or whatever you want to identify with. Your only privilege in life is waking up. Yeah, your daddy might know someone uh, who's influential. So what? Okay? Your daddy might not have been in your life and he is an alcoholic and disappeared. So what? But every single day that you wake up, you have the opportunity to wake up is a privilege in itself. And how you use that privilege is up to you. Most people don't want to use that privilege. Can we go back to like contentment and you know complacency? You know, what would your definition of you know complacency maybe be? Complacency is there's two types for it. There's the identification that I am a victim and therefore there is no need to change my life because if I stop being a victim, I lose my identity. You see, human beings believe that in order to gain something first, you must lose it. You know, it doesn't always have to be like that. You don't have to lose to gain. You can gain and gain and gain. So they become complacent in the fact that they're a victim and they stay that way because they're terrified about what they might lose in the process. If they lose their social grant, if they lose the way that people feel sorry for them, the way that people pity them. Then you got people who have tasted winning and go, Fuck, I made it now, I've arrived. And then go, yeah, I can carry on the way it is. That's complacency. And then what happens? Did you hear about this guy? No, his company liquidated. What happened to that speaker that was on stage five years ago? He was so good. Where is he? Complacency. So how would you, you know, if your business is doing well, or even, let's look at it from both aspects, as you said. Let's say it's the person that's doing okay. They're not doing amazing. They're doing okay. They're paying the bills, but they're not willing to maybe put themselves out there to achieve more. So they're complacent in being mediocre versus the person that's complacent in achieving a lot and then they're like, okay, well, I've achieved, made my money, let's put the foot off the pedal and then you kind of, you know, don't keep going or you lose it. So how would you then help that person and, you know, show them that, okay, well, complacency isn't Good, because through complacency might breed laziness and that laziness can also then influence other aspects of your life. It could influence relationships, could make you, you know, not take care of yourself and then your partner doesn't love you or whatever. You know, how do you kind of combat that? Well, let's start with the person who's just paying the bills and getting it, getting it, living from month to month, okay? If someone's been living from month to month for a year and... You know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing when, when I'm on stage and I ask people, I say, if I had to hand you a check for 100,000 rand, okay, 100,000 US dollars, what would you do with it? You know what the number one answer is I get from all of them? Go buy something. No, invest. They'll invest it. 
And I asked them, okay, cool. Show me your current investment portfolio. I don't have one. So you think that I'm going to believe that if I give you 100,000 US dollars that you're going to invest when you have no habit of investing? When I was a door-to-door salesperson selling magazines, I was earning 1,500 rand a month. Out of that 1,500 rand a month, I took 10% and put it into a savings account. I was living off cheese and tomato. I was living off an apple a day. Yet I still had the mindset to make sure that I was making the investment. And not, I knew 150 rand per month wasn't going to make me a millionaire. But you know what it did? When the opportunities arose to work with mentors, or I could buy a book, or I could sign up for Audible, or I could do something to improve myself, that investment fund is where I would pull from in order to grow as a person. Cancel your Netflix account. Cancel your Disney Plus account. All right? Stop shopping at Woolworths, shop at Checkers, whatever the case may be, but take a percentage. My mind was rich before my bank account. Would you say then like the main primary reason why people are in complete become complacent is because they've lost or they never had that mindset of trying to always grow and improve. Because, I mean, if you ha- always have that mindset, you're not going to become complacent because we know everyone has got friends where they they got enough money. They don't have enough to be able to travel or do things or they're always the people that complain about the money, complain about the money issues. But they're also the ones that aren't usually the ones pushing themselves and yeah. being driven. So how do you fix that? Because... You know, I know people in my life where they're doing okay, they got jobs, there's sustainable living, but it's always money's always an issue, or yo, look how much that costs, or look at this, but still complacent. You know, you, they're hyper aware of how difficult the times are, but then do nothing about it. Firstly, the times are not difficult. For anyone watching on this YouTube channel, the times are not difficult. They have been saying the times are difficult for since the since 2,000 years ago, okay? Times are not difficult. Times are what you make of it, all right? So during COVID, people lost their businesses. Other people became multi-billionaires, okay? You can't... If somebody is complaining about the government, about the economy, about their job, about their clients about anything, they're removing all responsibility from themselves. That's what needs to be fixed. Mm. Yeah, I think that extreme ownership and, you know, we've all seen, like especially in terms of South Africa. I mean, I love this country. Mm. And we see people that leave because there's more opportunities elsewhere or they believe so. And there's more opportunities actually in our country Mm. Because we've got a bunch of people that don't want to work or we've got a bunch of people leaving. So there's more opportunity for those who do want to work. Mm. I mean, I've never had a job that someone else has paid me. I've never had an employer. I've tried to, to the best of my abilities in all instances throughout my life from obviously after varsity to make it on my own and to never have to rely on a job, an employer and create opportunities. And People say there's so many opportunities in America, but there's the same opportunities in South Africa. The market will be smaller, mm. the competition will be less, but there are the same opportunities. There are as much opportunities in South Africa, if not more, because mm. of the, the you know the brain drain, the all the qualified workers leaving, all the people that believe it's greener on the other side leaving. Then you're left with the people that believe the grass is dead on this side and are just happy and complacent and yeah. provides opportunity for the people that want to push and want to strive and remain here in South Africa. Look, I said this once on stage and and then one person got offended and they actually got up and left. I said, South Africa is the richest country in the world with the poorest-minded people in the world. That's how I think of South Africa. We are the richest country in the world with the poorest-minded people in the world. 
You see, you look at broke and poor and rich. Those are not bank accounts. Those are mindsets. So if somebody has a broke mindset, everything around them is going to be focused on lack rather than gain. If your friends are making it month to month and they're complaining about how little money they have, well, the truth of the money, the truth of the moment, uh, truth of the matter. Sorry about that. Truth of the matter is that they don't understand what their values are. They don't understand what their purpose is. They don't understand what their vision is. They don't understand what they're working to, towards. Because money is not a highest value for everyone. Okay, wealth is is. Um, my highest value so in terms of how i make my decisions when it comes to investing when it comes to owning business when it comes to spending like i can tell you right now to the cent exactly how much money i have in my bank account i can tell you right now to cent how much money i have in my accounts i can tell you exactly how much money i got from my apple shares yesterday and so on i know exactly that because i love it it comes easily to me okay but there are let's, ladies, for example, who know everything about their children and their highest value is their child. Which is more important? Both are the same. Whatever they value is most important to them. There is no one value that is better than the other and no two people on the planet have exactly the same values. More often than not, people who have two opposite values end up marrying each other. Weirdest thing ever. So they don't see the connection between the lower value on the hierarchy and the highest value. So if you've got a hierarchy of values, this is John Martini's work, you look at the hierarchy of values and your value is... Your highest value is health, okay? Let's say it's, it's bodybuilding. But oh, I'm making any money off this, okay? Where's wealth on, on my list? Wealth is at the bottom. How do I move wealth up the, the value ladder by connecting it to my highest value? Okay, I'm a bodybuilder. I know other bodybuilders. I know what they go through. I know that there's people out there who want to be bodybuilders. There's always going to be bodybuilders. There's always going to be people who want to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. How if I, what if I take those bodybuilders, put them onto a podcast, and then allow them to share that information, get a sponsorship, or strike a deal with a company that allows me to do that. Also being able to create merchandise around a new way of thinking of body, bodybuilding for the future, a new way of inspiring other people. I love bodybuilding. I might take a step away from bodybuilding. I might just be interviewing. Part, and, and, and my third highest value is connection. So how about I take bodybuilding? How about I take connection? And how about I look at that and understand... How, do, how within that realm can I step into a place that inspires me and then the money becomes a byproduct of it? Mm. And I think the value and understanding other people's value is something that you should utilize in business because I don't value, let's say you want to come and use the studio. You say... Jesse, I'm not willing to pay you the money to edit and everything, but I have a contact with this person. I'll put you in contact with that person and they're going to help you open up another studio. For you, you don't see much value in knowing the other person, but you see the value that I will see in it. So you mm. can then connect me with that person and then I know the value of con being connected with that person is immense, but the value to me for free editing for free is nothing. 
Yeah. So then we can utilize each other's values mm. and equally gain something, even though the monetary exchange or whatever won't you know equal equalize. But what you value and what I value being different things, and what you value I don't. But I'm able to leverage off what you value and you leverage off what I value, and we both feel like okay, at the end of this, we both benefited. Yeah, look, it has to be a win-win-win situation. People talk about a win-win situation. No, it's a win-win-win. You win, I win, and the customer wins. The world wins. Because if we're not doing anything in collaboration that's going to push the human race forward, then why even bother about it? Mm -hmm. Now we're doing it ego eagerly. We're doing it, uh, uh, we're doing it um, for ourselves. It's selfish. You know, I used to be... Uh, I studied fine art, I studied photography, and I wanted to, I had this work of art, and I showed it to a, to a, um, uh, uh, like, like, not curator, uh, a gallery owner, a gallery owner, and she looked at the work, and she goes, wow, this is good, we should show this, and I'm like, oh, it's not ready, and then she called me a wanker, and for the uh, in, uh, international audience, basically translates to a masturbator and i go for me i'm a wanker and she goes you would rather keep this work to yourself and wank instead of sharing it and making love to the world and that that day i was like your talents your gifts your collaborations Everything that you do, if you keep it to yourself, you're the most selfishly talented person in the world. How do you get past the fear of not being good enough or thinking the work isn't good enough? Good enough for who? Good enough for, for what? For your own standards. Because I assumed your own standards were high and the level of work didn't meet that. But for her, and possibly the world standards, it was amazing. But for you you thought it wasn't good enough. Was it just that initial like push from her saying, like, give the world this? You gotta have people with high you gotta hang around people with high standards. You know, you can't eat with you can't fly with the eagles if you want to eat with the chickens. And that is a harsh statement to make because it's gonna mean saying goodbye to a lot of people. I know on my journey, I wouldn't really put the phone they're like, hey, you know what? I'm sick and tired of you complaining about the government the whole time. I'd rather not have to have this conversation. They phone. I don't really have to answer it. They phone again. They pop a message. Send a text. Move away. Move away from people who are draining you. Why? What do you think the biggest reason people would be hesitant to cut off ties from people that actually are bringing them down? Do you think it's just understanding the norm do you think it's fear of if things don't work out for me, then I've pushed those people away and I've no one to fall back on? Tell me this. You're 20, how old are you? 27. 27 years old. Will you take sex advice from an 11 year old? No. Okay. Some people are still virgins today because at 11 years old, they decided that they were going to wait for marriage. Wonderful concept, waiting for marriage. Okay? Unrealistic in today's day and age for those. Who, but people hold on to that. They hold on to today 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I meet a guy, I meet a girl, so on, so forth. Then they. You make promises to childhood friends when you were young and you're an adult and you're held captive to the promises you made as a child. What adult would listen to the logic of a, of a child when it comes to making decisions, when it comes to the betterment? doesn't mean you don't love them. I'm not saying hate people. I, I never say cut people out of your life. I say release them with love. Because they're on their own journey. What does releasing with love look like? Releasing with love looks like is 
to either have the conversation where you set the boundaries and standards and say, hey, you know what? I don't want to, I'm not going to go out to have that drink tonight. In actual fact, I'm going to cut down on the drinking. Um, when we're having a conversation and they bring up somebody else, bring up another name of another person, and say, now I heard this wonderful quote, um, simple minds talk about other people and great minds talk about ideas. Let's talk about ideas. Oh, no, I want to tell you about this person. And you say, no, I don't want to hear about it. So you can keep them as long as they don't cross your boundaries. 50% of them want to cross your boundaries. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to tell you you change. They're going to tell you you um, have become a colder person Oh, now you're trying to be something you're not. No, you're not trying to be something you're not. You're trying to be who you are. You're trying to step into your power. And the only reason people would say that, you know, the only reason your friends would look down on you for trying to take a journey of growth and trying to take and go on a journey and embark on bettering yourself is because, one, maybe they now feel left behind and they feel inferior. Or two is, you know, they're just scared that you're not going to be a part of their life anymore and they want you or the person that you used to be to stick around. And it's unfortunate that some people aren't willing to have that introspection and be like, okay, well, why is this person maybe distancing, distancing themselves from me? Why is this person seeing me less? Why do they cut me off when I try gossip? Why do they talk about ideas over, you know, complaining about the government? Like, why? Why? But actually, look at it. Look at the reason why they're doing this. They're just trying to be a better person. And that person, hopefully, most likely, isn't actually judging you for staying the way you are. You know, I know the people in my life who have stayed the way they are still want to entertain gossip situations and still want to complain and still want to put the blame on someone else. I don't look down on them because... They just haven't had the opportunities and the learning that I've tried to implement into my life. And there's no one on earth. I mean, even the person that does a really bad crime, I can't judge them. Because they have had situations in their life that have led them to that point and experiences and everything. And if I had those experiences, I can't say that I wouldn't have done the same crime as them. So I can come from no place of judgment because I don't know what they went through. And if I went through it, I might do the exact same thing. Mm. Look, people want you to do well, but they never want you to do better than them. The reason being is because we come from a tribal mentality. We come from cavemen. You know, you know. It's if you start to become stronger, will you then become the leader? And also, it it removes the excuse for those people who 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 want you to stay the way that you are. Because if you grow up in the same place, if you've share the same opportunities and you go on to do something extraordinary when they haven't they have to deal with the excuse yeah and people don't want to deal with the excuses i heard a fascinating quote the other day where it was a group of people asked it was in america if you were given a hundred thousand dollars as a salary and all your other colleagues were given $200,000, would you take it? Or would you rather take $50,000 and everyone else gets $25,000? And it was like 70% or whatever the amount, but it was a, it was swaying more to more people saying they would actually get paid less, but as long as it's being paid more than my colleague, I'm happy being paid less. And that's mm. just exactly what you're saying is, mm. I want you to do well, but not better than me. Yeah. It is, and it's sad. And I think that's why people need to go on a personal developing journey. I don't like the term develop, personal development because development means it's, it's finite, okay? It's, it's infinite. Mm. You can never stop learning. You can never stop developing personally as a person. And I think that's also comes back to complacency. It's like, well, I don't read a book 
today or I didn't listen to a podcast or I didn't uh, journal or I didn't do something that can help me. Maybe it is going to the gym, just walking on the treadmill for 30 minutes or something like that. You know, it's like you did a video the other day about running a 10K and you're like, step one, like I think it was... Uh, get up or step two put on your shoes step three was get outside you know it's that simple you know it's 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 that simple you know i think i'd die on if i had to run 10ks but then you contextualize it by saying even if you walk most of the way it's fine at least get the 10ks 10ks done saint francis said Preach the gospel at all times. And only when necessary, use words. People like you and I, it's one thing for us to sit and talk about this. It's another thing for people to see our actions. The people that have been anointed with the gift of speaking, just speaking, all right? The fact that we can speak into the microphone. One of the number one fears in the world is public speaking. This will still be considered public speaking, okay? We need to show people that it's okay. We can speak. Either we speak in a deep tone. Oh, we want to take it higher on our voice. It's an instrument that we perfected over the years. And we're still perfecting it. You know? But I think that people get stuck on just how hard the process is. They think that success just happens. And people are lucky. You know? Yeah, it's tough because I've caught myself in situations where you see someone that's hyper successful and I use quotation marks for hyper successful because it's obviously very subjective. But you see someone that achieves something and you'll be like, okay, well, maybe they had help. Okay, maybe they were corrupt in their methods or maybe this or maybe that. And it's like, why are you trying to look for an excuse as to why you aren't there? And yeah. I've done it many times. And it's true, though. You know, the moment someone becomes successful, a lot of people catch themselves being like, nah, they do this, or oh, he had help, or oh, this, this, or this. But it's like, they still did it, and you never. Mm. They're still there, and you aren't. Mm. So they've done it. You haven't. You mm. can't try to look for excuses or some scapegoat as to why you haven't got what they got. Mm. They still did more than you because they have done it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, look... The idea of a self-made man or woman is a terrible idea because you are not self-made. You are community-made. You are uh, God-made. You are environmentally made. My, one of my friends used to be my, started off as my mentor had this funny story about this fish, this, this quite a pond that he had at the office and one day he was walking past the koi pond and he could see all the fish were leaning towards one side and they were going all swimming with like you know almost like finding nemo type of vibes he was like okay so what do we do now so google this it's like apparently there's a racing koi they race koi and it's like this badass Mother Effa is like, you can buy these koi. So it's like, well, let's get this koi. Put this koi in the water. This thing goes, <laughs> swimming like it's like it's a, in the Olympia, uh, um, Olympics. The other koi are like, whoa, what the hell is going on here? Two weeks later, come back, that same koi is swimming on its side like that. The water needs to be changed. That was it. It was the environment. Okay. Now, the position 
that you are in your life comes down to two things. It comes down to your environment and it comes down to your standards. You will always get your standards. In 2019 or uh, in 2018 or whatever, like I never traveled internationally. I had to work from the dirt. That's why I've got the tattoo still I rise. Because you might drag my name through the dirt, but like the sand, or like the dirt, still I rise. Like, I come from the dirt. So you can put me back in the dirt, I'll be comfortable because I'll rise from the dirt. So I, all my friends had traveled overseas. All of them had been to places. I was the last one. And I was about 30 years old, going to have my first international flight, going to America. I walk in, and they, you know, they walk you through past business class first. And I get in, I'm like, what is, what is everyone complaining about? Like, there's a, there's a lot of space here. And um, Neil, who paid for it, who been on a business trip, he's like, Satch, let's go. I'm like, where's our seats here? And he goes, <laughs> Bro, we're in economy. And I go on a certain economy, and the entire time, I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't thinking about, yeah, I'm on my first international trip. Yeah, I finally get to go to America. Yeah, I can't wait to experience that. The entire trip, I had, I didn't even watch a movie. I just sat like this, I was like, I got to get a fucking business class. I got to get a business class. Two thousand and twenty, I set a standard that I will never fly less than business class. I've been to. Eight cities, nine different cities last year. I've, fl I've flown first class or business class. I will refuse to get on a flight if I have to sit in, in economy. My standard. Now we talk about environment. Talk about the environment it plays such a deep role in the construction of our subconscious. So the subconscious takes that as truth because the subconscious doesn't know what's real and what's right. So if you're surrounded in an environment that breeds negativity, breeds victim mentality, that's what the subconscious is. Then you've got to look at it and go, okay, how do I transcend the subconscious? How do I transcend consciousness? How do I go into a state where it's elevated consciousness? Where I look, I can watch and the watcher, as, as Eckhart Tolle would say, will say the negative things to you. Will say you're not good enough. But when you're in, a, when you're in, a, in an elevated consciousness, you could be in the worst place in the world and you can still be the happiest man, happiest woman. Viktor Frankl proved that. You know? So, set the standards high. If your standards aren't so high, you set standards that, that don't make you, that don't make you laugh or make other people laugh, they're not high enough. Yeah, I was, and it's exactly that, the standards I was chatting to someone the other day, and I'll try to be as vague as possible in case they're listening to this, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to offend them. But it was basically something where it's like, but after you did the thing, you still wanted to go and do more things. Why? Like, you just need to take a chill pool and rest. Yeah. And I said, like, once you always are doing something, and you're always setting high goals and high standards, when you are achieving those goals, it's not difficult to stay at that level and then you can achieve and do it and then go straight on to the next thing you don't have to 
be like, okay, now it's time to rest. Because then you're going below your standards. So if I want to run 55 Ks and do an ultra marathon, and then half a week later, I want to go do a cycle event with my dad, a three-day stage tour, just because that seems strange to you doesn't mean that it's difficult for me. Or not, obviously it's tough, but it doesn't mean that I'm overdoing it just because you're overdoing it is maybe going to the gym once a week. Mm. You know, it's the same as no one will be like, yo, you read a book a week. Or they will say, yo, you read a book a week. That's crazy. How do you read a book a week? But they've been reading and they read and that's the standard that they set for themselves. So when mm. they don't, it's like, I've kind of been slacking a little bit. Yeah. But to the outside observer, it's like, how do they do that? Mm. But it's just standards. I mean, if you've got a standard of waking up early, making your bed, getting to a journal or to a go for a walk or go to gym or whatever, it seems strange to the other person that doesn't have those standards. Yeah. But when you consecutively set standards in your life, you elevate, you elevate and your standards elevate with that. Mm. And, you know, you set the standard and then those standards create your habits and your habits create the person who you are. Mm. And it makes you be able to, you know, consecutively grow and become better. Because if you always wake up at five, I mean, what's more difficult, waking up at five every morning for a year or going from waking up at five or waking up at seven and then starting to wake up at five? Once you've been doing it for a year, it's easy. So someone in the outside observer might be like, yo, that's difficult. But when you're const always doing it, it's easy. Yeah. I think, and everyone has their own standards. No standards are better than the yeah. others. You know, it's like that's where you, you remove judgment. Like, if somebody has a standard of wanting to live month-to-month, paycheck-to-paycheck, uh, if that's their standard, then so be it, you know? We can, we can make an impact, but some people don't want to be impacted on it. Some people are so ingrained in it. And, all, and, and there's no need to put them down. No, there's no need to call them a fool or an idiot or whatever the case may be. It's just to say, I hope one day you come across a podcast, a book, a teacher, or something that resonates with you. And How do you it. help the person? Because let's say that person that said these things, I didn't say you know anything to bring them down, but... In essence, you know, she was saying to me, like, relax. Stop trying to work so hard. And my answer was just like, but these are the standards that I've set for myself. For myself. These are the things that I have done. And because I always try to set these high standards and work towards them, they don't seem like it's overdoing it or that I'm not relaxing. It becomes the standard. Yeah. And your standard might not be the same, and that's okay. I'm not saying your standard is wrong. You know, the standards that you set for yourself, they are your standards and that's fine. But just because, I don't know what the intention was, maybe it was you feeling bad about yourself and because you see someone else pushing so hard, it makes you feel negative about yourself or whatever it is. But, you know, in essence, she was looking down at me saying like, but you need to relax. Mm. You need to have fun. And it was just, from my point of view, I was like, but I'm not putting my expectations on you of what I like to live as a life. But because my life is different to yours, you can put your expectations on me. And it's the same as if we look at like fat shaming. You know, I, the person, obviously it's, you know, it varies from person to person. But most people will not like I know if I see people drinking or eating unhealthy or whatever, I won't judge them. But the moment I go out and I say, no, I'm not drinking tonight, there's judgment there. Mm. You know, it's very strange how, and it's obviously it's just people maybe feeling insecure or whatever that they put judgment on the person that's doing maybe the healthier thing or the thing that's going to help longevity a bit more. But people s tend to judge more on the healthier side, actually. Because I know for myself, if I see a super obese person in the gym training and trying to be in the gym. The last thing I would do is judge them. Mm. I see them like, that's awesome, good for you. Mm. And it's also our own feelings of feeling judged that we put the judgment on other people. And, you know, that's also in that echo chamber of, 
you know, we spoke about it earlier, vict- victimhood and, you know, the money aspect of complaining about money. The more you complain about money, the more money problems you have. The more you complain about where you are in life, the more worse things happen in your life. But when you start to v- see the good, when you start to just be like, yo, you know, these things happen to me for a reason. I can accept them or I can, you know, hate them, hate the fact that I had to experience it. And the person that accepts them and tries to use them as fuel is the person that's going to be able to move past them more than the person that's just stuck in them. Hmm. That's a long question. Was there even a question in there? (laughs) (laughs) But So how how then do you... I did go off on a tangent, but how do you then, you know, verbalize or, you know, help someone that doesn't have the standards that you have, that might not want to have the standards that you have, but subconsciously know they probably maybe should set high standards for themselves. Maybe their standards don't have to match yours, but set higher standards. You can only do so much. I've recommended... Books, I've recommended speakers, I've recommended courses, I've recommended stuff to, to people, okay, to help them print. I'd say 99% of them don't follow through. Okay. It then moves away from being my responsibility. Okay. It's not my responsibility for your mental well-being. Unless somebody is a psychotherapist and you sit in a session with them every week and you know they know exactly the insides and outsides of your life and where you're working and what you're doing and how you're managing your stress level, for someone to say to you, relax, take it easy, they have no right to say that to you. Okay? They could be saying to themselves oh shit, you need to work harder. But they won't say that to themselves. You know, I think the recommending podcasts, recommending books is probably the only way you can really go about it because maybe someone in that situation might be a bit abrasive if you had to you know, question their standards or question them as a person. Instead, just saying, you know, I read this amazing book. You know, yeah. or send them a meme or quote mm. or something. Like I think those are the kind of things to help people in your lives, maybe set higher standards or to think about their actions a bit more or to think about their motives behind their actions. Mm. I think in our society, because people, you know, are under a lot of stress and can't have the and don't have the tools to manage that stress that when there's a small bit of conflict or a difficult conversation they become abrasive so i think you kind of just have to lead with that love and you know hide it in a recommendation of a book or a podcast mm. as opposed to just being like Bru, your money problems are because of your standards read this book now or mm. Bru, set higher standards save more money or like you you can't actually do that coming from a place of love by being abrasive like that, or at least they might receive it as being abrasive. Well, offense and love, you know, it's it's taken. But okay. I think that's, you know, so if I had to give you um, constructive criticism, you would take it. Yeah. Because you would see from where it's coming from, and mm. also you will know, JC's not trying to bring me down, mm. he's trying to help me. Whereas the person that maybe doesn't have that level of understanding of themselves might see it as, you know offensive yeah but you also like my friend eric thomas says you can't take constructive criticism from someone who's never constructed anything in their life you know they go back to philosophers before seneca aurelius or so on i think the first philosopher that's documented was thales and they asked thales what is the easiest thing in the world and he said, to give advice. What's a, what's, a sec, so, uh, what's the hardest thing in the world? To receive advice. 
most people are talking to themselves. Who gives the best parenting advice? Who who gives the best parenting advice? Parents. No. Well, not in like stereotypically parents, but it's probably the kids. No, it's people who don't have kids. Okay. People who don't have kids will tell parents how they should how they should. But are you meaning parent. that give apt good advice? No, I'm just saying advice in general. Okay. Yeah, it's so usually the person from an outside perspective that's kind of what. It's not good it. advice. Yeah. It's the fact that human beings seek to speak to themselves. Who gives a, who always knows what the best diets are or what what's the, f- the easiest way to lose weight? The person that can't. <laughs> People that someone's o- overweight. Okay. Who gives the best marriage advice? The single person. Single friends. The easiest thing in the world is to give advice. Okay, but you can't take constructive criticism or constructive advice from someone who's never constructed something in their life before. And you know, I've been posting since December a lot of videos on Instagram, and a lot of, and all of them are advice to myself as well. Mm. You know, guidance for myself, and maybe there's some people out there that can it can help them. Like no video that I put out is any maybe about you know why a donut is unhealthy. Stupid example, but like I I've always known that, and may, there are people that maybe don't understand. But everything about like the self and positivity and happiness and everything, it's still advice for myself. Every video that I put out there is still advice for me. Mm. Just because someone's putting out a video on self-confidence in no way means that that person is self-confident. You know, there's some quotes, and I'm probably going to butcher it. It's um, the person that gives the best advice or guidance or whatever is the person that needs to hear that advice and needs to hear that. Like, don't receive advice and think that person has it all made. Or don't, if someone talks about, I think your relationship, maybe look at it this way and this way and this way. Don't think that that person's relationship is perfect. Mm. Because obviously in every aspect of every human's life, there's things that are damaged and have pain and you know aren't perfectly constructed. Yeah. But the person that gives advice, to a large degree, needs to hear their own advice. Mm. Mm. You, well, yeah? Social... Social media, not social media. Yeah. So it's, and you can see why the content is so, why the likes are so much higher, like why people are relating to it is because it's coming from a place of vulnerability, it's coming from a place of truth. You know, it's, you could stand on your high horse and put yourself on a pedestal. And when we put ourselves on a pedestal, we put other people in the pit. Some people are inspired to out the pit and some people make a home in the pit but what you're doing the advice that you're giving to yourself is is essentially you just changed your social media and your instagram account into a digital journal Mm. that's what you that's what you're doing and you're sharing the journaling process with other people and you're not you're not pushing an agenda you know and if you look at the last you know, you, you talked about people being stressed, okay? Or you said some people are more stressed now than ever or something along those lines. People have always been stressed. People were stressed during apartheid. People were stressed during World War Two. People were stressed during World War One. Winston Churchill was stressed as a prisoner of war in a concentration camp in the Anglo-Buru War. When have people never been stressed? But do you think the level of stress and is has always been constant? I mean, we know if we look at natural disasters or wars or political conflict or whatever, there's never been a as worse time as always. There's always a bad time politically. There's yeah. always a bad time with war. There's always a bad time with poverty and slavery and everything. Mm. There's never now is worse than then or whatever. Mm. But do you not think as we've developed as humans and as we've 
made our comforts, we've got more comforts, that we become weaker, so we are worse at dealing with actually low-level stress that maybe people who had to worry about World War II went through. They were stressing, sure, but they weren't as weak and you know spoon-fed with everything. I mean, we can sit here in the next hour, we can have food delivered for us, like, and then what we worry about, oh, our driver's 15 minutes late, and we start stressing about mm, that. Mm. But because we've got so much access to everything and whatever we want, whenever we want, the moment there is stress, we don't know how to deal with it. So do you think we the level of stress is the same? What we stress about has changed, obviously. But do you think our adaptability or to be able to deal with the stress has gotten worse? Or do you think it's the same? It's just lower level stress. And because life is easier we stress the same amount over Uber delivery being late as opposed to our son coming back from fighting a war. Like, obviously not, like, you know, we don't, our, our mom doesn't hear from us on a night out. She's super stressed. The same as the mom doesn't get a letter back from her son when she's at war. Like, it's completely two different stresses, but the level of stress might be the same because we are weak as human race. There was a man who loved ice cream and he was sitting at work and he couldn't wait till he got home to have this ice cream. Okay. And he got home, opened the freezer, and the ice cream was there. He said, you know what? Let me take a walk first. I'll come back from my walk and then I'll have my ice cream. Goes for his walk. His kids come home. Two things can happen here. He's going to come home. And his kids have eaten the ice cream. Well, he's going to come home. And they haven't. So he comes home. And they haven't eaten the ice cream. And he takes a scoop of ice cream. Enjoys it. So ice cream is so good. It's the best tasting ice cream ever. It's like angels dancing in t- on your tongue. The next day at work, he can't stop thinking about this ice cream. Gets home. Says, okay, I'm going to take my walk. Normally takes takes an hour walk. After half an hour, he can't stop thinking about his ice cream. He goes back home. As his ice cream. <sighs> so fulfilled. Next day, he leaves work five minutes early so he can get home. Study minute walk turned to 15 minute walk. Gets back home. His ice cream has been eaten. He's furious. He's angry. He takes it out on his kids. It's a kid. Kids love ice cream. Expectation can lead in two ways. Expectation can lead to greed or it can lead to anger. Removing expectation of how the world should be, of how your partner should be, of how your business should be, of how the Uber driver should be, removes those feelings of either anger or greed. Your Uber driver might be always on time and one day you book an Uber driver and he's late and you're angry because you're greedy that period of lateness results in stress but if you never had that expectation that your Uber driver is going to be on time you'd never have the stress of that 
Yeah, I think universally, and people can have different views on Stoicism and agree with things and disagree with things, but I think universally, people can agree that you should not allow things that you can't control to upset you. I'm pretty sure every human would be like, okay, yeah, I agree with that. Like, I shouldn't get angry that, you know, that person had an accident. Mm. Like, what is, everyone can agree that being angry that that accident made you late for work isn't going to change the fact that that accident happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to understand that, you know, you can't control the Uber driver. You can, what can you can control? You can control when you place the order. You can control being there at the position of pickup. You can control, if he is late, your mindset on him mm. being late. Mm. That's all you can control. You can't control him. Mm. You can't control the robots being out. You can't control mm. the your son's phone dying and then you didn't get that message back from mm. him. Like you can't control these things and trying to micromanage everything in your life will because of those expectations that you're trying to manage yeah. lead to disappointment and unhappiness and stress and it doesn't need to. Mm. Doesn't need to. Uber drivers like they, they there's two things that determine where they get rides, the level of stars and also the distance to the place. Do you think for one moment an Uber driver wants to be late to pick you up? No, he doesn't. He's trying his best to get there on time. Okay? As a James Ingram song, I did my best, but I guess my best wasn't good enough. He's trying his best. Everyone's trying their best. I don't believe that people are, are, are lazy. I don't believe anyone's lazy. Or I don't believe people aren't moving forward. I believe that they move forward in the wrong directions. Some of them are in a constant U-turn. They're doing it, they're spinning in the same spot. I think it's about looking at your life and realizing just how much little time you have left on this planet. You know, every time I see my nephew, I pick him up. He's eight years old now. He's got, a, he's got his own personality and so on. But I pick him up. I make a point of picking him up every time because you never know when's the last time you're going to pick him up. And I think that, even that mindset of you never know when the last whatever is or you never know what's going to happen next should also allow you to actually stress less mm. and worry less because... I, we could both die on the way home today. Like yeah. we we don't know that, but constantly being worried about the traffic, mm. or you know, minor 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 things, things yeah. that actually are inconsequential in the greater mm. scheme of things. Yeah. What's most important to live a good life? Mm. And you know what happened if we die on the way back home? Each of us die. Then someone's going to come looking in the studio. They're going to find this interview. It's going to be the last interview that you and I ever did. Might actually it's get gonna some be, views. It's going to be spread amongst all the speakers and everybody and cut up into different pieces and so on. And we'll go viral and we'll have millions of people listening to us all because we died. <laughs> we died <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, I was having the thought of, you know, death. And I always have the thought of death. And I think once we get past the. I would say like 24, you go into this existential mode where you start to realize your own mortality. You start to realize, well, I would hope people do, some people later than others. You start to realize how finite life is, how short life is, and how special life is, and to make the most of life. And I, having my own business, feeling my own stress, dealing with my own stress, coping with my own stress, relish in the fact that life is so short i love the fact that it is finite because 
It means that nothing is that serious. Mm. Life is so short. We are all going to die. My mom, unfortunately, is going to pass away, but that's okay. That just means that I need to cherish the time I have with her. Mm. My time as a young person is going to change. The seasons of everything in life. And that's what makes those times special. And because the finitivity, if that's even a word, of certain times in your life being short, and it helps you to be like, okay, well, does it really matter? Uh, with the thing I'm worrying about now, last week I was worrying about something else. I'm not even thinking about that worry that I had last week, mm. and that's gone. So this worry that I'm having now, why am I even worrying about it? Because mm. I know next week it's not even going to be there. And mm. when we start to live that kind of life of realizing what we're worrying about now next week's not going to be a worry so maybe worry about it less yeah. what we what that person said to us next week we're going to have forgotten so why worry about it now mm -hmm. you're stuck in traffic now once you get to the place you've forgotten what it was like to be stuck in traffic i mean think about when you're cold you're freezing mm -hmm. you get warm it's like you weren't even freezing you've forgotten mm -hmm. about the fact that you were cold mm -hmm. maybe two hours ago and it, that's what I like in terms of exercise and why I also do the ultra marathon what helps me get through it is during it suffering pain hardship struggle difficulty but while I'm doing it while I'm going through the pain the struggle the hardship you know what it's like to have finished an exercise and be like oh why was I so in my own head during the exercise I'm done now mm. you know I'm chilling on the couch I'm happy I've had a shower I'm a shower I'm washed I'm clean I'm relaxing, I'm watching TV, I'm eating pizza. Like, was it that hard? But in the moment, it's so tough. Mm. If you can just look at it in the moment and be like, I've gone through this, I've been through this, I can do this. Mm. I know in an hour I'm going to be chilling, I'm going to be happy. It's not mm. that tough to be in it now. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that some people get out of the cold and get into the warm and they'll sit at the fireplace and they'll still talk about how it was to be cold. They're physically, they're warm. Mentally, they're still in the storm. And I, you know this, I know this, freaking, even someone like Tony Robbins, whoever, it doesn't matter, Elon Musk, it doesn't matter how successful someone is. We all doubt ourselves. We all doubt ourselves. You know, we all think negative thoughts. I'm, it's like you can't be you can't be happy all the time. It's like Slotson was saying, happiness is moments. One moment I'm happy, one moment I'm angry. You know, so I think. Steve Jobs summed this up really well. You got to be curious. You got to be foolish. And you got to be hungry. And all of those things come from perseverance. Persevere. But if you're not persevering towards an aim or goal, no matter how big or how small or whatever it is, just have something, you know? Yeah, I think... Something to aim for. Yeah, because everyone is going to be going through some struggle. Everyone is going to be going through some sort or form of hardship, even if they're not working towards a goal. Even more so, maybe, your hardship that you go through is going to be more difficult because you haven't set a goal and there's no reason, really, to be going through that hardship. You know, if you are trying to save money, going through months where you barely have anything because you're saving, because you have that goal of saving money, it, it's easier to save money. But if you aren't trying to be like, okay, I want to save X amount, and you constantly have no money, having no money is more difficult. But if you set a goal of saving, having no money is easier to go through because mm. you've set that goal. You know, going through a difficult workout is easier if you've got a goal of trying to transform your body or get fitter or whatever, if you just have to go through a hard workout, it's not going to be as easy without that end goal. Mm -hmm. So we always have to have end goals in life. And it doesn't have to be massively grand you know, goals. But I think without those goals, without setting benchmarks working towards, 
you're going to struggle because even the person that doesn't set goals is going to go through something that's going to make them struggle. So at least go through the struggles with a goal in mind. If you don't follow your dream, if you don't make your dreams a reality, you'll make someone else's a reality. You'll make your bosses a reality. If you're working in a company, you're making their dreams a reality. Everyone will die playing a role in making a dream a reality. It might not be yours. It but might not be yours. Yeah. Most of the time, it's, n it's never yours. And just start. And it's, it's you know, you could, you could do one thing today. What would it be different? And say, I learned this from Robin Banks. The next time something that angers you happens, don't go, oh my God, motherfucker, motherfucker, fuck, 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 no. Just go, how fascinating. That question will start to trigger things in your brain. Go, what is fascinating about this? A small thing. Okay. Greet the car guards. Ask a car guard how, how their day is going. Greet the tiller. Ask the tiller how their day is going. Give money away even if it's a little bit. Do you know, I've heard, yes, so interesting, yesterday, somebody, I was in the, in the line at Woolworths, and this black gentleman came up to me with this baby formula, and he's like, he just came to me, and he's like, um, I don't have money for this, can you pay for it? I'm like, okay, I'm like, uh, it's okay, fine, yeah, just give me the thing. So I paid for it. And then he said, thank you, and he went. And I was like, is there even a baby? Like, uh, like Did I just like, get scammed? The, uh, well, my thing is that that's his own karma to mm, deal mm, with, mm. you know? And it's so interesting because i just been to Woolworths. How fascinating. And I bought all my juices and so on. But I didn't buy my six-pack of water. So I go from to another mall. And I'm like, oh, I forgot to buy the water. Now I need to go and buy. Now I need to go to Woolworths in the Mall of Africa. So I go to Woolworths in the Mall of Africa. Just to go and buy that water. And this guy comes up to me. Let's say he does have a child. Let's say they can't afford to feed it. Let's say the child survives, gets stronger, has something to eat. What if I was meant to forget the water at the first moment? How fascinating. Mm. And also I think if you... Don't have what you want in life. Give to other people. If you feel like you don't have enough money, give more away. If you feel like you don't have enough confidence, give someone else confidence. Mm. Give them a compliment. Pay mm. them a compliment. If you are unhappy, be kind and loving to other people and make yeah. them happier. Mm. Whatever you lack in life, mm. try give to other people. And I think we need and have actually an obligation as humans to do that. Mm. If I don't feel self-confident, if I don't feel confident and I'm self-conscious, tell the lady at the tail at the teller that she has nice eyes. Yeah. Make her feel better. Mm. And in doing so, maybe she'll give me a compliment back and then I'll get more confident. Or, you know, being more kind to that person and lending them some money or giving the car guard money or whatever, or letting the person in front of you. That pays off. And you will yeah. get closer to the life you want by 
giving other people what you believe you lack. Mm. Flash your brights when the robots are out and let that other guy go in front of you. I found, interestingly enough, the more people I let go, the more people let me go. Yeah. I've, in the last like two years, every opportunity I try, unless I'm really in a rush, mm. I do try to the best of my abilities let other people go first. And I, I don't know if maybe I'm just aware more of me myself being let go by other people but i feel like it does happen more the mm. more i let people go the more people let me go the more i'm kind to the ladies at the tills the next times i'm at the tills they're more friendly mm. and or maybe i'm just perceiving life in a more positive way but mm. i think that's even if mm. that person isn't more friendly than me my perception of them, them being friendly is great it doesn't matter actually if they are friendly or not mm. but just by me being friendly me perceiving them as friendly everything in my life will shine mm. and get better i've been really friendly to people lately and i've been known to be a bit of a so people call me sag it's a gen some people call me sergeant when i work I'm very Steve Jobs like. I'm very I'm uh, you got to do the work. The work can't be sloppy. The work's got to be good. Everything is clinical. Yeah. And which is what allowed me to become successful when it comes to my clients. I'm not the nicest person to be around in a work environment, or well, not anymore. And then I, when I started to understand deeper of who I am and why I behave that way. You know, there's a wonderful saying, if you, don't, if you don't heal what cuts you, you'll bleed all over people who don't. I attribute that to Candace Mama. When you figure out what cuts you, you'll stop bleeding over other people. You know, I started to be nice to people. Not st- I didn't be nice, I'm just being me. Mm. All my friends thought I was dying of cancer. <laughs> they thought I was dying. That, that, that was the first reaction. Why are you being nice? <laughs> Why are you being nice? What's going on? Are you dying? And I'm like, yeah, we're all dying, if you think about it. We're all dying. But I I think that, you know, we can have this conversation for hours, dude. And there's so much to talk about. But, like, I don't know, can I give one last thing on... Please. Like health. So, I'll direct this to the camera. You can do it to the camera. This is... When I grew up, I never had positive real, uh, role models. My role models, positive role models were Sylvester Stallone, Bill Murray, and so on. And... Uh, well, let's come back to you. Who, who are your positive role models outside of... Outside of, like, my yeah. immediate family and that kind of... And, like, teachers and stuff. Um, and I... The first... In terms of, like, training and mindset and everything, I don't know if you know a guy called Greg Plitt. So, Greg Plitt, he was... When YouTube, like, was kind of in its infancy, he was always posting training videos. He was, like, a military guy and did, like, military workouts. He, interestingly enough, actually died. He was hit by a train doing a, a youtube video so that's the kind of guy he was like that kind of just paints the picture of like his mindset was mad so he was definitely like my icon because it was always mindset and training tv for me my role models were also like like batman batman was definitely a role model maybe not the healthiest role model emotionally because he's very emotionally distant um Yo, it's tough to say who I really... Like, for me, it was always, like, superheroes. And, yeah. And maybe sportsmen. Yeah. Maybe maybe sportsmen, you know, rugby players, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sportsmen were big for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kimi Raikkonen, mm. um, Schumacher. I'm a big Formula One fan. Okay, nice. I, it's, uh, you can ask me anything about Formula One. Football, so Alex Ferguson... Okay. You know, his managerial mm. style. Jurgen Klopp now is leaving Liverpool, which is going to be a big thing, big loss for them because, it, you know, the, the the fish rots from the head downwards. So they've lost, they're going to lose their head. But I think for me, as one thing I can think, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it so badly, 
<clears throat> it's from the famous philosopher Rocky Balboa. Yo, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Because that's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers, saying you ain't where you're supposed to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. And that's the thing that I say to myself every day. It ain't about how hard I hit. It's about how hard I can get hit and keep moving forward. How much I can take and keep moving forward. Because that's how winning is done. Amazing, bro. And that's a fantastic way to end this off. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming through. I appreciate your words of wisdom, your guidance. And I know that people will find value in what you said. Cool. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. And for everyone who's, who's listening, even if one person listens, be kind, be nice. Um, you know, as my good friend DJ Corey always says, be cool, be safe, be beautiful. No, that's it. Amazing. Thanks, cool. bro.